everybody, welcome back to the music chat. We are going to start our chat today by uh, singing and playing the um, very popular um, song, um, In the Garden. And um, we're going to start it this way so that when we're chatting about it, you'll have had a chance to hear the words. And you know, if we start talking about the verses a little bit, you'll um, have heard it already. and It'll be fresh in your mind. So, uh, Barbara, please sing for us now, In the Garden. Okay. refrain for In the Garden, thanks to Barbara, and um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the composer, um, who was, uh, what's his name, Charles? Um, it's Austin Miles. Austin Miles, yes, mm -hmm. and um, so we'll um, let, let uh, there's a whole story about how he came to write this uh, that we, mm -hmm. we found out, and it's a pretty amazing story. So tell us about his experience in, in his photography basement. Well, and again, you know, here we go with a thought about a particular song, and then we start looking at it, and the backstory is just like so interesting. Yeah. Who so knew? You know? Exactly. That's Who knew? Thing. And it happens over and over. So anyway, um, Mr. Miles was born in 1868, and he died in 1946. So um, he 
was a person who was educated at the School of Pharmacy at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, he was a pharmacist. He also had a hobby of being a, a photographer. And, uh, and he wrote uh, poems and so uh -huh. forth as well. Um, and so um, often, he lived in, in Pittman, New Jersey, I believe is, is the word where he lived. And um, so often when he was allowing his uh, proofs to be, um, what, what do you call it, uh, to be developed. The and, pictures, and right. He had a, yeah. a photography studio in his basement. So he would go down there and he would work with his um, photos and uh, in the red light that they do in, in, um, in photo labs. And he discovered that while he was waiting for the uh, proofs to develop, he had enough light to read. So uh, he would, he sat and he um, opened his Bible. And it opened up to John. And it opened up to John, the, the 20th verse. And so he started reading it. And he tells about this experience. And I, I have his words here, so I think I'm just going to read them so that you can um, hear exactly what happened with him. One day in March 1912, I drew my Bible toward me. It opened at my favorite chapter 20 of John. That meeting of Jesus and Mary Magdalene had lost none of its power to charm. As I read that day, I seemed to be part of the scene. I became a silent witness to that dramatic moment in Mary's life when she knelt before her Lord and cried, Rabboni. My hands were resting on the Bible while I stared at a light blue wall. As the light faded, I seemed to be standing in the entrance of a garden, looking down a gently winding path shaded by olive branches. I awakened in full light, gripping the Bible with muscles tense and nerves vibrating. Under the inspiration of this vision, I wrote as quickly as I could the words and formed the poem exactly as it, it, it appears now. Right. So he was inspired by his reading of John chapter 20, and it's, I don't know if we want to read that or not, or just explain what it is. Well, it's uh, where Mary, we can just tell about it, it's the part in the Bible where um, Jesus has been crucified and he's gone to the tomb mm -hmm. and Mary reaches the tomb um, and he's not there mm -hmm. and so she's pretty distraught mm -hmm. and so that account is you know just talking about um, basically how she must have been feeling and um, you know we, we were talking about um, um, the fact earlier that uh, before we started the chat, we were talking about um, how these things sort of come, you know, and how people interpret them. And, um, you know, so um, I, I know myself, and, you know, there's times when I'm thinking about something and I sort of detach, you know, mm -hmm. I think this is what may have happened to him as he sort of detached from himself. And, you know, he was reading the chapter and he was imagining, mm -hmm. and he just kind of went to this place and, and sort of stepped into her, mm -hmm. almost like he he was thinking so um, intensely about how Mary must have felt about the situation that mm -hmm. she was in, mm -hmm. and that he you know he really was kind of kind of detached, and um, mm -hmm. you know kind of went someplace, and you know how you sort of break out of a trance. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how what I think he just was thinking so hard, and then kind of came back into the photography room mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I've got to write this down. Exactly. Know, so. And my thought also is, you know, there's that time right before you fall asleep where you're kind of awake but you're not awake. And mm -hmm. It could have even been that sort of thing. You know, right. you don't know. He doesn't say that, but then you mm -hmm. wouldn't be totally aware of that anyway. Yeah, at the time. exactly. So anyway, he was inspired by that. And, he and later, I guess, after he wrote it all down and he was finished and later that evening he, he wrote, wrote the, the tune. The so tunes. he's the writer of the tune and the music. Exactly. Case, right. Um, and so therein lies the controversy with this particular song. I know um, I probably never ever connected it with John 
chapter Well, 20. I never knew there was a controversy either until well, he started, started writing I know. today. Or, but uh, regardless yeah. of, of the controversy, I never really connected it with any verse in the Bible, actually. Right. And I, I, don't, I don't know. I think that, a lot of people don't. I don't think mm -hmm. most people do. Um, and there was some uh, explanation that it's really an Easter piece because right. it is about the resurrection. So, um, and about Mary. Magdalene and, and so anyway people have used it to have lots of discussions and to talk about Mary Magdalene to talk about um, where the garden was whatever you know <laughs> many 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 things to, to right. think about and I think for our purposes because uh, we've we've discussed it as well um, I, I'd like to look at it just how it has become um, what role it has played. Right, and you know, our chats are really um, about music that people find inspiring. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we're just going to think, you know, we're going to talk about why we think that it has a lot of um, meaning for people mm -hmm. and why it does inspire. I think so. Um, and, you know, just just to that end, I mean, it, uh, you know, as a church organist and, and church musician for years, um, I can say that it, um, certainly is a requested uh, piece of music that people want sung or played at uh, their loved one's funerals. Right. Um, now it's not in our hymn book. In fact, I don't even think of it as a hymn. I no. think of it as a song. Let's go back to that a little yeah. bit because mm -hmm. he wrote this. Um, he was involved with uh, writing things for the um, uh, for Billy Sunday, who was an um, evangelist, and he, this, remember, this is like in 1912, right. really beginning of the 20th yeah. century, and mm -hmm. think about um, the, the I, I hear so often about the evangelists that were going around and having these tent meetings, mm -hmm. and um, so he wrote this specifically for that, and uh, it is, is a sentimental song. He wrote it, I think, to inspire uh, people in that setting. And um, later on, and it's been recorded by everybody. Everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, it also had a, 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 a place in the Billy Graham Crusades. And we talk a lot about um, the fact that during the mid 20th century, uh, those were on TV a, a lot. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people that otherwise were unchurched, I think, um, listened to those and heard this music. And we also talked about the fact that uh, you get requested so often at funerals. And um, my grandmother requested it. And I know that it was one that she always felt very dear um, too. She was not especially a church person, but she watched those mm -hmm. um, crusades. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we have to kind of, in my mind, it is a, a, a popular genre gospel tune mm -hmm. that was written specifically for these meetings. I don't think that uh, Mr. Miles really wrote it to think that it was going to be in Hendel's. But as it evolved, and people started hearing it, and it became so endearing to them, they started requesting, like in the Methodist right. hymnals or uh, in the Baptist hymnal or whatever, that it be included. So, you know, that's that, I guess, is when the uh, theologians and the uh, musicologists have to stand up and get put in there. Yeah, and two cents and, worth about you know, it. There's, <laughs> there's been a lot written about the theological basis or maybe right. the not theological basis right. for the hymn. And so if you're interested in pursuing that, there's been a lot written. A lot of stuff. Know, and, um, and I welcome right. that because yeah. it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It I, is interesting. We both found it It's sort of thought-provoking and you can kind yeah. of see both sides. Uh, we can sum that up in just saying that the, the main uh, controversy seems to be centered around the fact that it's a very uh, personal account uh, rather than a more of a communal uh, yeah. gathering point mm -hmm. of view. It's a point of view. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's written in first person. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of our hymns, if you really look, there's a lot of them in there that mm -hmm. are written in first person. 
Um, so, um, but that seems to be um, part of the controversy about it as being like a valid hymn mm -hmm. is that it um, that it, it's it's sort of a personal account and um, that it embellishes. Uh, you know the scene. It's written in a romantic right. way with the dew on the roses and romantic. the hushing of the birds. Mm -hmm. And um, you know those are. He was in the romantic era of poetry, mm -hmm. and so that's what poets did. That's what poets still do. Yeah. Is they you know try to um, create a setting. And mm -hmm. so um, you know um, you know our personal feeling is that he wasn't trying to have some literal. Uh, recreation of the theology of, that scene, of, of, of the Channel theology. 20. Yeah. I think he was inspired mm -hmm. by it. He was but inspired, I, yeah. I don't think that that was his right. intent to do right. that. Again, he wrote it for the uh, evangelist meeting. So he did. And, meetings. I, and I think he was, um, maybe you read where he was involved. You know, he stopped being a pharmacist. Yes, he did. He, mm -hmm. he gave that up because he had more of an interest in writing music mm -hmm. and writing specifically for the gospel revivals mm -hmm. and that's how he wanted to be remembered that's right yeah he he was he was a very religious person himself mm -hmm. or a spiritual person and that's what he you know he said he had a quote about how he wanted would have been honored to be remembered by that you know something to that effect and yeah. um you know, so that that's how it what he wanted, and he became like involved in Hallmark Publishing or mm -hmm. Hallmark. I forget what the name of it was, um, but um, he was associated with that, and I think maybe that was the Billy Sunday's uh, publisher. There. You yeah. know, they was they were together involved in that publishing, and so a lot of hymns were hymns and songs, gospel songs mm -hmm. were published through that um, publishing house. Um, yeah, that, so, yeah, so I think that's where it first gained its popularity and then later on, oh, another storm Yeah, of through. course, it wouldn't be um, a music chat without a storm. <laughs> uh, I think that's where it gained its popularity and it became a beloved song and so that's when those uh, times to, to create new hymnals came around. People, you know, said, please put this in there. Right. Of its popularity and it is it, for, for me, it's always just been um, a song that, first of all, reminds me of my grandmother, mm -hmm. and second of all, um, is is about your walk with God and the fact that um, he, God can be with you through lots of through lots of things that happen in your life. And right. I think you have something. I do. You were talking about your your grandmother. Yeah. Um, well, Loretta Lynn was one of the artists that recorded this, and she actually wrote about um, why this was a, a song that um, was special to her, and it had to do with her um, relatives, her mm -hmm. deceased relatives. And um, so I, I'll read you a little bit from her article. It says, "I think in the garden is popular at funerals because it offers a different kind of comfort." than the kind provided to Mary Magdalene and that the garden is a different kind of garden than we see in John. To me, the garden represents heaven. And in the first verse when we sing, I come to the garden alone, we are coming to see God. We have fought the good fight. We have finished the race. We have kept the faith. It is time for rest. It is time for God to tell us we are his own. And she comes to that, you know, she thinks, she also says, in the garden seems like a farewell song, missing optimism and sadness simultaneously. And she had come to that um, conclusion with a sort of a life perspective, um, which is sort of interesting because we were talking about the life of a hymn. Mm -hmm. You know, hymns start out and they, you know, as you experience something in your life, you know, I know this from, from uh, working with lots of pieces of music, like you come back to a piece of music and you see it differently. Mm -hmm. And then you come back to it again and you see it again differently. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot speaking in these hymns that reveal themselves sometimes even more than the author or composer ever even intended. Right. You know, so, but she uh, she starts her article by talking about the fact that it had been used at, and at, at uh, her grandmother's funeral, I believe it was a grandmother, maybe her grandfather too, and um, that, that they themselves had requested that mm -hmm. this be sung at their funerals, mm -hmm. and so um, she, um, she talks about ha hearing her mother hired a singer to sing it at her grandmother's mm -hmm. funeral. And she says she watched as, as it was being sung and, and the singer would get to the refrain and her cousins and, and you know, 
relatives sort of just sort of one by one weeping and starting to it's tear very up. Yeah. So you, you know that was her um, very personal experience with this mm -hmm. hymn, and, and, and there you know she you know had sung it herself then mm -hmm. and many times heard it and, and then had those words about what the garden represented to her, mm -hmm. which I thought was really a, a good I way to look at it. If something is written well, we can look at it and use our perspective to make it special for us. Right. Um, if it's written well, I think it has that capability. So to analyze it to death to me is not <laughs> the main thing in this particular right. situation. I believe that we give it some time today because it has been so special um, to so many people and it is requested so often. Um, in, in, if, in planning worship music, we've talked about this before, um, I, I feel like it, music and worship should always involve the congregation so that they feel a part of it. And there should be things that, <laughs> there should be things that meet them where they are and things that are familiar, songs that are familiar, but there should also be an, I've always felt, this ability to raise their level of experience with music that maybe they don't know. Right. Um, and the fact that uh, we have maybe a different volume of things that are in our experience and we know how beautiful it is right. and how touching it can be that our job also is to try to raise their level of experiencing other types of music mm -hmm. as well. So you, like you said, at a, at a funeral so often people ask for this and you want, at, you, at a funeral, you want to give them whatever is what going to give them. had meaning, absolutely. Meaning and comfort. Mm -hmm. And then you also just kind of weave in a little Bach prelude or a little <laughs> whatever, you know, because you know that that is music also. It's also uplifting. That is right. uplifting. So I, I think in worship we just need both. We need mm -hmm. those things that are really uh, comforting and then we need, I think, some other things that we've had to work a little, as a, the choir might have had to work a little bit harder to, to make special and to bring that to mm -hmm. um, the congregation as well. So. Yeah. Well, the gift of music chats for us mm -hmm. um, has is, has been and continues to be that um, we we pick these hymns for various reasons. Um, actually, this week we picked this hymn because a friend of mine had right. had, had a her mom uh, was passing this week, and mm -hmm. she sat with her and sang this song to her because it was a favorite hymn of hers. And um, you know, so. You know, I had just arbitrarily asked her, I said, did your mom have a favorite hymn? And this is what she said was her favorite hymn. Right. And so I said to Barbara, let's, let's do this for the music chat. And so then, you know, you go and you <laughs> start researching it and you find out all this stuff about it. And like I said, the gift of the music chat is it makes us um, look at things and look at them anew. Um, and um, I mean, I was... You know, have my Bible out reading John 20 this I know. morning. You know? <laughs> I know. Because <laughs> I'm going to, okay, what's all the hullabaloo about this? Let me see what it really says. And um, the one thing I did find out, I was telling Barbara before the chat started, that um, I did find that uh, in, in my account in the King James Version, Mary saw thought that Jesus was a gardener. Mm -hmm. And so maybe maybe where this was was a garden. I don't know. Yeah. Now, now if there I don't know about the olive branches and the dew on the roses. Don't know. But <laughs> well and before we we leave this, um, the only truth we know is what we read in John. And so right. but that truth has also been spun over the centuries by uh, there was a Pope in the early centuries who uh, spun who Mary Magdalene was because they, he was not very happy that there was a woman that possibly could have been that close to Jesus without right. her being like a prostitute or mm -hmm. something. So it's interesting, that was something else that yeah. came up with this, like wow, they were spinning the truth and doing fake news 
way back then. <laughs> yeah. And, so. you know, it's like they had that agenda, and back then, who was to question if a pope came out and said that? That's you know? right. They're not going to question yeah. it. So that was another thing that came from this, um, all the kind of fake news that, <laughs> that um, went around uh, this whole scene mm -hmm. and what, what that, that means. Um, right. So it's out there. It's interesting to read about. It is. And, um, you know, in the, in the privilege that we'll have of, of uh, presenting this him again, uh -huh. you know, probably in a funeral setting, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, I, I don't think I'll ever um, play it again without um, really thinking about it. Right. You know, I don't it's not, for me, it's always, you know, I've got to find this piece of music and I've got to make sure mm -hmm. I'm. Um, you know, play it, play it in a meaningful way, but, um, you know, I don't think I'll ever really look at it again the same way. I won't you know? either. And I, had, it won't be taken for granted. <laughs> I don't think, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, I guess, um, but I don't think I ever connected it with John verse 20. No, and, you know, 20. Um, I, you know, I think if you um, ask most people, the garden to them is what Loretta Lynn said. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's um, it can mean anything to you. It can mm -hmm. be just a quiet walk in the woods, mm -hmm. or wherever you meditate, mm -hmm. and that God is walking with you. And so the bottom line is, if He was able to create that kind of song, that's right. That does that for someone's faith, then He did a good Absolutely. thing. Absolutely, it has Absolutely. tremendous value. Absolutely. And probably will be for many years yeah, to come. Yeah, I so. think so. It has that appeal. Yeah. So it was pretty interesting. So um, when I was exploring, I found, um, I, I don't know if you'll agree with me, but I love Elvis's rendition on <laughs> YouTube. So we're going to put the YouTube link. Um, it's He sings it very slow and, and very, uh, what's the word, heartfelt. Mm -hmm. And um, he has sort of that gospel choir with him mm -hmm. and the refrain. And it's a, it's a really, um, I think, uh, just very satisfying uh, rendition to listen to. So we're going to uh, YouTube link that. Um, and um, I it's, think it's all over the place. So it I is, mean, yeah. There's so many renditions. You certainly of it. you can look up your favorite mm -hmm. music artists from the 50s, 60s, and century, yeah, mostly century. they'll have almost yeah. anybody will have recorded it. Yeah. Um, so, um, but we'll put that one on there, and uh, we'll see you next time on the music chat. Bye.